Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont Show. And I'm Bruce Wilson, Executive Director of Service Rendered Incorporated in Arkansas Wonderful. And um, Straight Talk Vermont is a program of Service Rendered Incorporated. And I am very honored today to be here with our Honorable Lieutenant Governor, um, David Zuckerman, and also my friend. So, Lieutenant Governor, how are you doing, sir? Well, I'm good, and I, I hope to be Lieutenant Governor again. At the moment, I'm candidate for Lieutenant Governor, okay, but uh, sure. I was Lieutenant Governor, right. and um, certainly sounds good. Right. Well, you know what? <laughs> once a, you know, once a Lieutenant Governor, you're always one, right? You Fair know, enough. You know, when you know, how that works, maybe you, if you're in a mayor, you still say mayor to a person, right? Fair if, enough. If Absolutely. Of, all right, then. So, so anyways, sir, um, I, I'm so happy that, you know, first of all, that you're running again, you know, to to be lieutenant governor of this, of this great state of Vermont, and um, and and I'm, I'm and I'm proud of you too, you know, what I'm saying? because I know you got a lot going on in your life with the farm and your you know your family, and um, there's so much, and but you know, you have a lot of ideas and suggestions, and you and you've done a lot for this state, you know, for Thank many you. many many years. Appreciate and that. And I've always been one of your supporters, person, your personal supporters. So so why are you running again, sir? Why am I running again? Well, I. Uh I get, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, but if we look at some of the issues I've fought for for a long time have not been resolved. Uh, we've got new major issues that are very urgent in this moment. You know, obviously the economic situation for most people is really hard, uh, whether it's finding housing, rental or ownership. Um, the prices are going through the roof. Uh, the climate, we're very fortunate. We have this incredible yeah, lake behind us. I was just taking in some of the beauty and kind of meditating on it. But at the same time, uh, we are not um, living on this planet in a way that's going to make it possible for our kids and grandkids to really live uh, as fulfilling lives. And, and I want to fight for that and fight for some of the changes that we need to make either as individuals or socially and um, for policies. Uh, and, um, you know, there's, there are so many injustices and inequities in our society from financial to social and legal. Um, and we're sitting near the old uh, police station. Yeah. We know there's some uh, disparities yeah. in how we have yeah. law enforcement. Uh, and so it's really, uh, you know, you name which of those issues. Yeah, and sure. granted, the lieutenant governor doesn't make laws, doesn't have a direct hand in the laws the way a governor does, uh, but at the same time, the way I've always worked when I was a legislator, when I was a House member and a senator, was to really um, reach out across the state, reach out across the park, uh, reach out into communities and really work as an ambassador with people so that their voices could influence the system. And I do think as Lieutenant Governor with those networks all over the state, we could influence what's going to happen um, all over the state and in the policy making arena. Uh, so I was honestly asked by a number of people last fall, um, really deep into the winter more than the fall, saying, wait a minute, we want your position on issues, we want your activism, we want your engagement to be back in that office so that we can um, continue to build and make Vermont better than all these issues. So let's, let's go back to the housing part. Um, yeah. uh, God, it's tough, right? And um, I think it's, I know it's really tough in, in Vermont, you know? Yeah. And, and it's certainly um, tough across the country. But um, also, so the thing is this, you know, you know, the, the fair the, the fair housing rate of people to lease and buy homes is, is incredible up, upwards, and um and a lot of people who are um you know can't even I don't use the words economically challenged you know what I'm saying to um to you know yeah they're struggling being, they're struggling Super trying to, struggling. to afford just the rent on a place uh, and um it's kind of you know I think it's real weird when like. And I'm just gonna say it because you know, like if you got a place in the Old North End in Burlington, and you got a place in the South End, and you know, in the South End, it's you know a lot, lot better. Why is the prices the same in Old North End? You know what I'm saying? Why is that? You well, know, why are they pay the same type of way? Um, well, well, to me, a lot of what's going on is it's the supply and demand realities of a capitalist system. No doubt. That's the bottom line, and we have folks that believe we should just have unfettered capitalism. And many of those folks are at the top end of the spectrum. Yeah. And they're making a lot of money off speculative housing markets, off of um, exploiting all of us as consumers with various advertising makes us think we want something that we might not really need or want. Um, and yet 
they've convinced many, many people that this system is good for everyday working people as well. And there are others of us who believe that there may be benefits to capitalism, but the whole foundation of capitalism is if you have money, that money makes money. And one of the ways it does it is if you have money, it's easier to buy a property and then you can rent it in this moment for exorbitant rents or you can hold on to it while it then appreciates in value while everyday people aren't getting any of that. And so some of us believe in some forms of regulation, uh, whether that's um, regulations on renting. You know, right now we're seeing a lot of long-term rental housing. The houses used to rent for a year-long lease or a multi-year lease going into short-term rentals. Because right. you can make more money renting right. for four right. weekends than you right. can for a month. Sure, sure. And that's sure. happening all over the state. And so now, you know, younger people or people in transition who just want to rent for a few years before they buy, there's not enough of that. So rents are going through the roof. And then Vermont has become a very attractive place to live. Uh, we handled COVID well. We have a better environment under the changing climate. Um, people know about Vermont from Ben and Jerry's and Bernie Sanders and others. And um, it's, it's a, become a, a refuge for folks who believe in um, participatory democracy and actually voting rights and women's reproductive liberty. I mean, you name the number of things that make Vermont attractive, um, that, that hits that supply demand issue. Sure. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that's really hard to mitigate quickly. You know, Vermont has put, I think, well over $100 million of the COVID relief money into affordable housing, but that's going to take a few years yeah. to build. Uh, we've been talking about regulating things like Airbnbs and VRBOs and short-term rentals, but we haven't really gotten a handle on how to regulate those in a way that disincentivizes moving stuff out of long-term rental into short-term rental, which means workforce and younger people can't afford to rent places. No, no, so. These are all the things that are in the sort of push me, pull you, milieu of uh, where does government regulate and restrict pure free market capitalism in a way that helps protect everyday working people from what capitalism does. All across this country, one of the biggest places that Wall Street hedge fund investors are doing is investing in housing. It's becoming a commodity, not a basic need and basic right. That's a problem. People are being left behind. Yeah, no doubt about it. Sorry for the long answer, but no, housing is no, huge. No, no, housing you know, is huge. We love to hear you. Everybody, I'm sure, would love to hear you, the answers that you give, because um, you, you know, you know a lot about those answers, uh, those questions. Um, so, did you know, and you probably do, that Burlington, in um, part of the um, COVID release funds, are building um, 13 shelter pods. Right. I mean, 30. In here, right in right in Burlington, right yep. on Elmwood Street. It's called the Elmwood um, Shelter Community. Okay. And um, 30 of them is going to be built around the um, where near the post office is. Okay. And um, a city owns parking lot, double sized parking lot, and that's where they're going to be built. And, and the construction and it's going to be started really soon. Um, what do you think about? Uh, and they all tip, supposedly temporarily. Tem temporarily, right. and which is which is a, a good thing to say because we are hopeful that if it's temporarily or temporarily, right there, that means that these people that live there, these individuals, um, will go off to find better places to live and better things with their lives, based on um, hopefully the help they will get through other nonprofits. Right. So hopefully it's not just housing, but then there's. Uh, you know, economic support services, there might be mental health support services, um, educational services. I mean, there are a number of ranges of reasons why people end up houseless yeah. and living on the street or in the parks or, you know, hiding behind buildings in dark spaces at night sure. to sleep. And I think we all recognize that that may not be the healthiest for them. And at times it may not be healthier for other members of the community. Um, and there's and there's reasons to try to help people. I think yeah. we all yeah. want to do that. Some folks want to be out, but many have fallen into this situation, often through no fault of their own. No, no, no. But the economic strife leads to a sort of a downward spiral. No, 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 no. And so, um, the last thing you said about helping them with their um, systemic things, you know, education and uh, jobs and uh, you know housing and things like that. From this, um, they are going to build a resource center there. Whereas that, I don't know exactly what it entails, you know, 
I'm hopeful that I can help them out with, um, you know, help more people with, um, you know, jobs and um, just with the yeah. system thing. You know, Finding people pro need employees. Providers, providers there to help them with um, systemic things they may need, like, and like educational things too, like also learning about like your thinking errors and the patterns and things that you might fall under that might maybe cause you to be in like more in a high risk or economically challenged or you know um, situations. You know, I'm not saying that they all are, but it's for following hard times, but. I know from coming from Chicago that mostly um, the highest risk and not economically challenged neighborhoods where high risk people those are always individuals there with uh, who's um, who lives in high risk who's been a part of high risk and have done things in high, high risk you know and so I'm a little concerned even though I'm concerned about the project and in, in, um, in, you know I think it's an awesome thing to have places where people see public events. In the Battery Park, like you see that that those, that tent built over there, right? And uh, City Hall Park, sure. And, and down in the woods and stuff like that, where there, um, I think it's more safe to stay at these this in this some place, this um Elmwood Shelter um, community, than than those places. Um, but I think you know it's still going to create some high risk. That's what my own thinking is based on what I know. Yeah, there, you know. there's fear and risk certainly with this situation and with many aspects of our yeah, lives. Yeah. And um, I think it's legitimate to be nervous and it's also legitimate to be hopeful. Yeah, yeah, and hopeful. we, we um, you know, we have a lot of really excellent, uh, knowledgeable people who are, I think, involved with this. Um, and the goal would be that uh, to keep those risks to a minimum. Um, you know, we're often fearful of others that we don't know. When, when you actually look at most harm done in society, it's done by someone we do know. And so uh, I think it's legitimate to be afraid. It's also legitimate to um, want to support the concept and, uh, you know, support the people who are going to do the work to help these folks. Uh, because if we don't, there's, there's further danger if folks stay in these patterns, uh, we just unfortunately had a, I think a death murder right. in City Hall Park. Right. And, uh, you know, we have to try to minimize that like yeah, that risk as well. So, well, like, not easy, not no, easy. So I think it's like it's been 24 murders or 23 murders. This, and, and guess what? And you probably already know the, um, the, the epidemiology, the epidemiology is that um, they're all in that same area. You know, that same area is all those, mostly all those shootings are in that same area. Yeah. And another thing too is that um, where that, you know, the beautiful old North End where I've lived many, for many years and so much, it's incredible. All the vibrant people, vibrant. small local businesses. Yeah. You know, it's sort of in many ways uh, the small community that we all cherish. Yeah, people no know each other on the street. No about it. Um, you know, a lot of times in bedroom communities, people don't even know their neighbors. That's true. And I would say in the old North End, people probably know their neighbors yeah. more than a lot of. And there's a lot of culture and ethnicities, and it's so incredible, beautiful. You know, but it's also listed as one of the highest risk neighborhoods in, in the whole entire state of Vermont. Yep. You know, the old North End. You know, what I mean? and, and 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 economically challenged. You know, too as well. And so, where these shelter community is being built, it starts right off in the old, in, in the, uh, like the old North End, you know. And so, so what I want to ask you this, Lieutenant Governor, why, in, across the whole entire United States, probably in the world, that people, when they start building up, um, like the projects in Chicago, they build them in the, in the, low the income lowest and income the, highs. Why? This, well, the nuts and bolts of it is that people with more political clout, folks that vote in higher numbers, which neighborhoods vote in higher numbers, which neighborhoods finance campaigns more, um, tend to have more political voice. And a lot of times, I mean, there have been affordable housing ideas put in for um, Shelburne, and they faced a lot of opposition because we have stigma, and with that stigma comes fear. Uh, and so, there ends up being this long-term systemic reality that there's more services in some of those neighborhoods. And so then the argument is made, put uh, the places that will be housing these folks closer to where the services are. And there's the argument of, don't put that out here or in my neighborhood because it's a longer way on the bus or there aren't services. 
And so these are the systemic systems that get put in place that then give different communities the argument. So don't put it here, put it over there. Um, and so it's, it's not a single reason, um, but it's, it's this accumulation of where have we been putting services, where have we been putting affordable housing, where, who has political clout, uh, and so it's a self-fulfilling set of circumstances, yeah. AKA the system. So um, I think if people don't want this in their neighborhoods, and I think there's discussions as to why that's a legitimate or maybe something we should work on dispelling, um, it's partly participating in the system and knowing where the votes are. You know, when I said Shelburne, I could have easily said some aspects of the South End and the New North End. Um, but the other part of it is if we want people to have both access to services and access to jobs, more of those jobs and more of those services are downtown. Um, and so, like I said, it's, it's partly systemic and it's partly practical. So here's a funny story. So in Chicago, they built a lot of these um, projects along, um, I think it was a, a Robert Taylor Homes around the lake. And, um, and they, um, and then all of a sudden, some person thought of, wow, all these projects is around the, on the lake. So let's start, let's move these individuals to the suburbs. Because mm -hmm. people from the suburbs move, out in whatever reason they did, to out of the city because of you know, whatever, whatever, you know. And so, so we're going to move the people, so the people in the suburbs move back so to the city. So then the waterfront becomes the... The valuable right. property so for tore, Right, so they tore down all the, the uh, a lot of those um, um, projects and moved those individuals to the suburbs, to the people. <laughs> well, I mean, part of it is we should really be looking at a more equal distribution. Uh, well, yes. We gotta we gotta be living with each other. We gotta be um, in community with each other. You know, I think when we live in more mixed communities, whether they're economically diverse, whether they're culturally diverse. Um, then I think a lot of the um, stigmas and misrepresentations can also then be broken down. You know, it's very easy to paint some group of people in a certain light if you don't know anybody who's in that category. And um, so I think that's, that's a piece of what we need to be looking at, but that is a more expensive way to do it. Yeah. Clustering people, building denser housing is a less expensive way to do it, and government uh, really since Reagan and Reaganomics has had fewer and fewer resources for so many of the things we need in society from our education system to our roads and bridges to our human infrastructure and the investments in people and we're now suffering the consequences of that over many many decades and we've seen the concentration of wealth go through the roof uh, we have the most disparate economic circumstances that we've had in this country since just before the Great Depression with the wealthiest people having huge, huge percentages of our society. I think the wealthiest four or five people in this country have as much wealth as the uh, least wealthy 50% of this country. And so we have um, seen government perpetuate policies to concentrate wealth, which have also created the on the ground problems we're facing today. And we've seen more and more segregation by, by culture as much as by policy, um, but by economics fundamentally. And if we don't work to shift that trend, then we will see pods like this placed in certain neighborhoods as opposed to all of society recognizing that all of these issues are for all of us to solve collectively. So um, I've been fortunate, you know, as one person is African American and the person who lived in Vermont since 1989 to be appointed. You and I came here the same year. That's right. All right. Yeah, it's the whitest state in America. Man. Still, still is pretty damn white. <laughs> it's all right. It's all good. But uh, I've been, I've been fortunate to be appointed um, to the Human Rights Commission as commissioner to the, um, to, by the governor, and um, I'm also um, um, inclusive in Bologna. I was appointed by the city council and, and mayor in Winooski. I sit on the um, Green Mountain Transit Advisory Board for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Training yeah. and Inclusion. Um, also with the um, Chittenden County Regional Planning, with the um, a lot on e your plate. E Equity Advisory, and um, the Municipal School District, um, Anti-Racism Committee. So my question is, and I'm so I'm very fortunate to be able to help make some decisions 
and, and, and give some ideas, suggestions, and learn from others about the ways people should work, or everybody should work together in Vermont. Can I flip a question on you sure. before you ask right. me? Sure. Do you feel as though your perspective and ideas are respected on those committees? And do you feel that, or based on just raw numbers and demographics, do you, are you or do you feel like you're a token mm -hmm. member? Or do you feel fully included in those conversations? Yeah. yeah. So those are good questions. Yeah. And so, for, so first of all, I, I, I as a person who um, look like me, a person of color, you know, um, I believe that, um, and in and, and my character, my personality, which you know, I'm straight up with anybody. I don't yeah. care if the president of the United States sitting around, I'm gonna be we're just humans. like we're human beings. We're right? humans. And so I think um, on that aspect, people are very fortunate to have me around mm -hmm. and a person born and raised in Chicago we've been through the civil rights movement you know as well right. you know I've been in, I, I, I see things I understand things um, I'm if anyone who um, will put me on these inventions as, as a person you know, like a token it's got they they yeah. but they don't know they got me. more than they bargained <laughs> they for. don't know me you know what right I'm saying? so do I think I'm fine as by I, your peers on those committees right, sure. does it feel like a, a good set of people around the table well the thing is that um you know um, as as you like, we just discussed. Like, I think Vermont is like the second one state now. Maybe it's the first still. So my peers around the table are not really, in, you know, they're my peers, but not really. My, they're humans around they, the table, right, but they don't have the experience. They, you right, do. they're not people who look like me. You know what I'm saying? So, so I don't think they quite understand. Like, um, like for instance, like I say this all the time that, like, I don't go to school with you. I don't go to church with you. I don't live next door to you. You know, we're we're not. Uh, I might see you at the grocery store, or whatever. So we really don't know each other to communicate. A lot of times, individuals know about me. Through um, um, do the TV, do um, stereotypical ways, um, right. and so they don't really know me until they know me. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so, so I say to people around the table with me who are learning and, and part of all these boards and advisories that I sit on, um, and a lot of them, especially the Greenmount Trans, I'm on, I'm on that, that advisory team. Jedi, um, there's a lot of people who. Um, who are um, from other countries. So they, they, they have their own, they know what's going on. They, they feel, mm. they, all you gotta do is a person of color and you, and you get it, you know? And so they, they make good, have good answers. Um, so for me, and, um, uh, and uh, let me see, the bottom line is the, um, the, dim, the um, outcome measurements. I think in that, uh, I believe that, um, that um, it's not, you know, it, we're not nowhere near we're, we're any outcome Where measurement. Where we need to be. There, there is no outcome measurements. You know, you know what, you know, Lieutenant Governor, um, sir, um, the thing for me, let me, let me just say this to you, is that, um, you know, there, one time there wasn't no, you know, when I went to um, college or whatever, high school, I never heard about no um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I never heard about that, you know. And they probably have a major, you can major that in college now. And I've never seen that no major like that in college. Mm. And so now, ever since with uh, the issues with the uh, people of color, with the police, you know, Black Lives Matter, Floyd, you know, every, everybody needs to hire a, some equity director, mm. you know, in the, in the, and that's probably around the world, you know. And um, what 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 is their job really? You know, mm. equity director. What is their qualification? How do you hire a person like that? You know, I don't care. I will tell you this. I don't care. If you have 150 PhDs, you know, you cannot be an equity director if you don't have life experience. Right. You know, you know, you, you can, you gotta, like, I can talk to any white person in America and then I can tell them some of my plights or some uh, stereotypical things that happen to me or just some racist things happen to me. You feel me? You understand? It's, it's not, it don't feel good, but you ain't gonna feel it in your heart like somebody. If I'm telling exactly. you another person who looks exactly. like me, so so a person who have life experience are the best equity directors ever, you know. And so and also, and I'm, I've said this many times, I don't I don't, I believe that um, companies hire these equity directors or diversity, equity, inclusion directors is because. If they don't have one, then they they out the loop. Well, do you have a DEI? Do you have a DEI policy? Do you have a? Do but you also, are they going to then do something real with it? Is right. it just performative or is it real? Right. Now you're talking about token, tokenism. Right. And that's, exactly. Yeah, right. So so that's I believe that totally. All the anti-racism and human rights commission, commissioner I am, I, all those things I believe in. You know what I mean? I still believe that it's um it's a it, you know if you it's just a tokenism. I don't believe that. Um, there's a anybody should have an equity director at any of their firms or anywhere. I believe that 
they should come up, you know, there's some smart people around the country, you know, there's people who, who, who like regular people like me, who can come to and talk about um, diversity and equity and inclusion, you know, and how I feel and stereotypical stuff. I believe that if, you know, I don't need to teach or tell a white person that. I need to tell a white person that. But the white person also need to tell me what they think, how they mm -hmm. feel, what their culture is, how their ancestry or what they learned through ancestry, what their beliefs are from coming up through their generations. Right. You know, and why and they you know, a lot of them will tell you that they didn't they don't believe that they've been stereotypical, then or they don't they don't they're believe unaware. They, they're yeah. unaware. We're unaware of our biases yeah, for sure. And we all Absolutely. have biases. And so so together all of us need to sit in the same room. And, and come up with these answers. That's the only way we're gonna make a difference. I can't. I don't need to come up with the answer where people look like me, and then and then um, try to teach the white person. How stupid is that? When white people all need to be together and come up with the same. And answers. so this board, these boards you're on, yeah. um, have that mixture of folks. And are those conversations happening? Well, you know, there's always an agenda on every meet, at every meeting, right? Right. And so, um, so who sets the agenda? <laughs> right. So. And there's always a, so we do some, um, um, you know, they do the best they can for what, for the information that they get in seminars and we bring. Well, cool. maybe you can help the chair with the agenda. Yeah. Well, you know, I you know I think um, we're gonna be doing some of that um, with the inclusive belonging. Um, yeah. They asked. Because we said, we know, and I'm glad to say, because I, I said the same thing to them. And, um, and I think everybody, you know, had some answers around that too. And that, so we're not going to be a chair at the Inclusive Belonging. Mm. It's, a new, it's a new commission for yeah. the city of Women's okay. And so everybody, commissioners there, which I think is like five of us, um, will make a set of agenda. Sort of consensus agenda. And, right. And so I've been, Great. yeah, so, 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 um, so we work with the city manager and we work with uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, city councilors and the clerk yeah. and, the, and the city clerk to the air part of our group and so um, and the mayor is so, uh, Mayor Christine um, not and so um, so I'm glad that we decided that that's going to happen that we're going to all of us make an agenda and so as we because new we only had like two meetings so far and as we go forth then I'll be, you know, I'm, you know, one thing that I said to them too is like bringing in people, you know, like other people, you know, other cultures, other religions, other um, relationships, you know, peers, you know, that have, so they can voice their ideas, and, you know, people like even I said, oh shit, I didn't even know, I didn't know that, you know, what I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, how can we work together and make sure that that we don't, you know, that we make it better for everybody, and all it takes is. Is everybody just talking to their peers? And you know how that goes—a vote count. You know, you sure, can you can sure. do all kinds well, of. Well, no, yeah, you need the votes. But um, no, I appreciate it. I, I just uh, I often hear about the different committees that are made and people on the committees. And the question is, are people heard? Are the issues able to be not only brought up but then appropriately addressed? Are the changes and policies? Yeah. You know, being sure. implemented. Of course they are. Um, <laughs> and you know, I didn't mean to sidetrack us. No, but I think it's right. pretty important. And I'm glad and you I said, I'm to hear you what you had to, um, And then, you know. and I want to add too is that um, one of the things about um, um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, what people are saying is that they uh, want want to have like all people in the back room. You know what I mean? Making these things. And for me, I'm like. Get rid of that damn back room, man. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. well, what are we need the back room for? You know what I'm saying? Let's get rid of it. Nobody needs to be yeah. in the back there. Let's make the decision in, in the open. Because a lot of times, like, it, 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 fortunately and unfortunately, I've been in those back rooms. You know what I'm saying? Right. And um, and and um, people, you think when you come out to um, the big room where everybody's sitting, that you got a chance to to be a something or you know, whatever it is. You know? Sure. And then all, they have already made their decision. In the back room, who's gonna get the job? Who's gonna, you know, with the money's well, gonna? Yeah. Make. A lot of people have already made that that decision already, and they come out there like nothing happened. You know, like we didn't make this decision. And you, you know, people are hopeful, and then Johnny gets the job or Jane gets the job. You know what I'm saying? They we already they already knew who's gonna get the job. And um, you know, and you know, I don't, and, and I'm tell you something. Since you asked me that question, I don't believe this is ever gonna change. It's not, it's not going to change. I mean, that's it's been not, the way, unfortunately, for a long time. Although well, often, well, the world was but, real, but not just real. in white culture. No, that's what I'm saying. In a lot of different cultures. That's what I mean. I, I think it's an interesting dilemma because, on the one hand, having been a policymaker for 18 years, um, I would say, at least that my experience in Montpelier was the vast majority of it was in the public setting and the conversation around the table around do we include this language or not? 
um, and having committee votes. Um, on the other hand, each person on the committee is an advocate. They're an advocate for their town, they're an advocate for their people, they're an advocate for their perspective, whatever it is, as legislators or as, as you know, advisors on these different committees. Um, at some point, decisions need to be made and with the different perspective that you bring, you want the decision to be in a way that fits the world as you know it and might solve challenges in the way that you know it. And you know, on your way in or out of the meeting or at coffee with right. one of your colleagues, sure. you you advocate for why yeah. something no is doubt. should be a certain direction. So is that coffee the back room? You know, or yeah. is it where you That's try true. to advocate? That's true. That's so there's true. a little bit of both yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. and I don't know that absolute all of it most of it should not be back room or coffee table or whatnot. Um, but sometimes when there's an impasse, sometimes people are able to go talk a little more quietly to try to figure out what's the, the deeper root for the impasse and is there a way to create a solution that both sides can live with and can those two people bring it back to the rest of the group. So there's a little yeah, bit of that yeah, that sometimes yeah. has to happen, yeah, that's true. but not so much as a back room or any payoffs to make it happen, but maybe not in the limelight. Um, but most of it, I've experienced, and I think should be yeah. a more public conversation. Yeah, one, one thing, sure. one thing I appreciate about myself is, and I tell all my youth and my staff, and they will tell you, is that um, I, you know, I, I get like I tell them, I say I'm not a doctor, lawyer, or energy chief. You know what I'm Don't need and to. And so if I if I need those answers, I'm gonna go to the doctor, lawyer, or energy chief, or the lieutenant governor. If I need those answers, that's where I'm gonna get the answers from, from the person who know who does the job. And so I don't and make decisions. Uh, like my youth advisory board is around. I don't make decisions on youth issues without talking to my youth board president. You know, I don't make decisions about a uh, doctor lawyer. I talk to maybe Dr. Lewis first or something, but um, or Lieutenant Governor. I'll talk to you um, without doing that. So when I'm in the back room or in the, I mean, the coffee house, I don't be making decisions with people. I be trying to figure out what's good. I mean, how can we work together? Right. I be synergizing, proactive, being proactive, and trying to collaborate. And I, I'm, I'm very proud of myself for doing it because I don't feel good about. It making decisions about something that other people without hearing from the person who should be helping make maybe has decisions. more history or knowledge about yeah. it whether it's lived experience yeah. or education or so, both yeah totally. and so so let's talk about youth yeah youth. yeah let's so get that on the table lieutenant governor so um youth are so important to them we created in 2003 probably remember youth on boards for the city of Burlington. now it's part of now we just did a new resolution for youth on boards in the city of Burlington. It was approved and unanimously by city council. You, more, more, more commit, more committees they can sit on, and more and voting rights. And yeah. now it's in, now it's happening. We did we helped in it's in the state of Burlington. It's in uh, Essex. Yeah. Of course, not in Essex. It's quite. It's working in Essex, but it's in Winooski, and um, and so we're very happy. He happy that youth on boards has been people appreciate youth on boards and so youth are so important you know i think everything we do is for, for some youth and some you whatever some youth do you do for some little elementary school kid or something um so how are they gonna how are they gonna be cool? well you work for youth forever you know and i think we when we met you was um beth rosensky one of my uh, uh wow. int interns back in the day and um and, and I forget what we what, what you did with us. I don't you, remember, but but, you, but it was about yeah. youth stuff, yeah. and that was years oh, yeah, ago. Yeah, years ago. Yeah, you know, and Beth was like she was like dedicated when she was my um, actually she was my one of my coordinators, and she's like she's incredible today with her uh, community activity. activity yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, so so why do you how do you fit in on your government, sir? How will you fit in? Well, a few things. I've, uh, when I was lieutenant governor, we definitely had some interns where they could learn more about how the system worked and get engaged in really understanding um, how to use their voice for most effective change. But also, I've really enjoyed going to elementary school groups and high school groups, talking with and answering questions from young people about the system. You know, the, our governmental system has been... Um, both knocked down and, and naysayed by the sort of more conservative side, which just says government is bad um, for a long time. And I would argue a, 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 an agreement that our government has failed, our policymakers, and I didn't win the battles I was fighting, so I failed too, to really shift how government works to be more effective for everyday people, including our youth. And um, some of the ways I've talked to youth and, and listened is try to 
help empower them to the idea that right now, in policy making, young people have the opportunity for a louder voice than they used to have. And the reason I would say that is, you know, a lot of young people feel like, well, if you're 18 or under 18, you can't vote, therefore you have no voice. But we have methods of communication now where young people could email or social media their legislators or their city councilors or their commissioners and say, hey, I hope you're thinking about this issue and I would love to hear your views on it. And if you, excuse me, I apologize between no, farming and getting no, up no, early get and doing the politics, it, I'm just yeah. tired all the time. No, but, but if, um, so I apologize. But, no, no problem. But you could, as a younger person, 16, 14, send a note to your policymaker. They don't know if you can vote. They don't know if you do vote. They don't check. But they've got a personalized note or letter asking them about some issue or to get involved in an issue. And they should respond. If they don't, ask them again and say, you know, I sent you a note a week ago. I recognize you're really busy, but I hope you'd get back to me on this because it's important to me. If they don't again, then you say, you know, I've been trying to reach you. Um, I don't know, you know, I'll try you by leaving you a phone message as well, but I hope you will treat my question with respect and get back to me with an answer. Sure. And if they don't, then at some point you say, well, I'm going to post a front porch forum that I've tried to reach you two or three times. You have neglected or chosen, or maybe I have failed to communicate with you in a way that you, you read or get, mm -hmm. but um, it's really disappointing yeah. to me that you're not giving me your opinion or your attention as one of your constituents. Right. And I tell you, when a, when a city councilor or a legislator um, sees a post or hears about the fact that they've been sort of called out after res multiple respectful attempts mm -hmm. for, for good dialogue, uh, they're going to respond pretty quick right. because yeah. you don't want to be in that position. Um, so partly it's how to empower young people to be involved in the policy making and through their representative democracy, whichever form it is, city, state level, to um, affect the outcome. So if you care about the climate, if you care about economic inequities in your neighborhood or in our society, if you care about policing, if you care about education, you know, you could name whatever it is and, um, and you can engage in how that policy is made. And we do such a bad job of teaching that through civics and through those of us in these roles um, that we have to rebuild that, yes. that people have influence. Um, more so than most other systems. Is it as much influence as we'd like? Is it always hurt? You know, do the old North Enders have less influence than the South Enders? And therefore, things happen in one neighborhood and not another? Well, this is a self-fulfilling and perpetuating circumstance. And if we, if we get more people involved and using that voice through policy and through communication, um, then maybe some of those disparities will start to be addressed. So, uh, I'm going back to um, Mike quickly. Mm -hmm. then, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, what sure. do, how do you, how do you, how, how, how do you think we're going to make a, you know, a difference with that? You know, you know, I mean, I think when you look at so many of these issues, they stem from systemic economic injustice and inequity. And right now, when you look at who is uh, economically struggling in our society, it's people of all stripes. But it's disproportionately within each population, it's disproportionately women, it's disproportionately people of color, it's disproportionately trans and non-binary people. And so therefore, if we work to address economic inequity, we will work to disproportionately uh, address those economic inequities that are hitting those communities harder. But also, those in the power structure really want finger pointing. They want poor white people pointing at immigrants and pointing at trans folks and pointing at communities of color and pointing at you know, women as the reason that they're struggling. Right. And this is a narrative that is fomented by those who firmly believe in concentration of wealth, that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, even though it is shown statistically that if you're in a certain economic class, you almost never move up to another class. No matter how hard you work, no matter um, how hard you, you know, put other aspects of yourself aside, your family or your kids, it is really hard to move between classes. So unless we address some of that, then we won't be able to address 
the finger pointing where people blame those people for my struggle. Right. When the system is holding you down. No doubt about it. It's not those people or no. those people. Yeah, right. And um, so I think we really have to address the economic injustices while also shining light on how these systems over time have perpetuated these inequalities, no have perpetuated it. these segregation in different ways. Um, but they're all interrelated. And they're all related to the fact that there's some people who live way high on that hill that don't have any of these realities in their life. Um, and they don't want to see them. They don't want to deal with them. And they, they move to, to protected areas to do it. That's, that's the system in a nutshell. Now, do we have people in Vermont with resources who are willing to pay more or who um, are willing to put their money where their mouth is to try to challenge some of these inequities and injustices? Yes, we do. We're probably luckier in Vermont to have more people willing to do that than elsewhere. But the numbers still speak, and, uh, and we still have these challenges. So um, as a um, human rights commissioner, the um, good thing about that, having that position, is it is that um, it's just we, we follow we have we, we have to follow the law we have laws that we have to follow and there's a um, and um, but not everybody has to follow them equally that's, that's, that's part of the problem that's what I'm saying so when we trying to um, make decisions all that stuff's on the status on the law so Vermont Human Rights Commission has to follow things on the law and so well, do you my question is do you think that um, there should be some more laws made around hmm. diversity equity inclusion because a lot of people they are not gonna really gonna talk, go out of their tradition, what should I say? Right. Of who they are and what they I know. think there's a combination. There's certainly room for more laws. At the same time, we're not enforcing the laws we have. You know, we need stronger leadership to say, wait a minute, we have laws on the books that aren't being enforced. Right. You know, George Floyd was trying to pass a, a, a counterfeit $20 bill and lost his life. You know, Donald Trump has duped people out of millions and billions of dollars and he's still walking free. He has, he has stolen top secret documents, stolen, and I'll say that, because you are not supposed to take them with you, right. period. Right. Um, and he's walking free today, and will continue to do so probably for a long time. So, and there are lots of other people who um, walk through life with privilege where they have the, the ability to pay for lawyers to get them off of things that other people are thrown in jail for 20 years for. So the first thing we have to do is resolve why our laws are not being applied right. in a just and yeah, fair yeah, manner, true, true. as well as yeah. maybe tweak some of those laws so those folks can't get sure. away with it. Right. And so we aren't disproportionately punishing people um, because of poverty. Because that's really, yeah. you know, um, race is involved and poverty is involved with the disproportionate enforcement of our laws, yeah. no doubt about yeah. it. Well, we can't leave out what Donald Trump said. He can, he can, um, he can kill somebody. He can somebody kill somebody. Yeah. He can do anything he wants to do with a woman, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he has stated how unjust the laws are by his own statements. I mean, it's just, it's blatant and it's right in front of everybody. And that's why people do feel such cynicism about it, whether it'll be changed. And I think it's fair to be cynical. Totally fair. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but hopefully we yeah. make progress, and no, we got to make progress faster oh, than man. we are. No, you know. We got to make progress faster yes, than we yeah, are. Yeah, we, we do, and so I just you know I'm very hopeful. You know, uh, Vermont has been like first on everything. You know, to do everything. You know, many, in, in many, many, yeah. in many ways, and um, you know I think uh, they, they um, Vermont love people. They love their neighbor. They love community. They love being activists and volunteering. You know, yeah. I've learned that since I've been here since '89. <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, and um. And so, um, well, I'm hopeful that it will get better. The whole thing about it is got is about communication and education, right? So I think, like, like, like I said, I'm not next door neighbor. And now it's had uh, self reflection. Self, yes, sir. Right, yes, and sir. especially for people that walk through the world yeah. as I do, yeah. uh, you know, privileged white male in positions of power with reasonable uh, economic circumstances, uh, have to reflect on what got us here. Yeah. And it's not about guilt, it's about understanding. And when you understand it, then you can start to see how the system needs to be changed and or how one can apply one's own resources to try to foster some of that change. But, you know, um, I think, so, anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you, no, but no, I do no, think right. self-reflection self is That is, is very, it's like, like Michael Jackson said, the man in the mirror. 
There you, you know go. I mean? For real, you know what I mean? You got to look in the mirror and, and um, see what's good, you know what I mean? Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. Every day, you know, and actually... And say, really, how did I get here, as to, to do another musician, Talking Heads, you know, how did I get here, and um, who are these people around me? Who is right. this wife? When am I, yeah. Why am I in this house? No, not about and, it. And uh, it is both our own hard work and the hard work of those before us, and some of the circumstances that made it so that that hard work was rewarded more for people like me than it was for people like you. Sure. And therefore, how do we change the system so that A, hard work is rewarded to everybody equally on that uh, effort they put in, but also how do we right some of the wrongs of history sure. and, and help foster more opportunity to folks who have been left behind or disproportionately enforced by our laws or disproportionately impacted by housing laws or housing practices or educational laws or educational practices so that we can change that trajectory for uh, more folks in a more positive way. Okay, so let's, let's go back to the shelters, right? Yeah, quick. sorry, big stuff. No, yeah. no, no. So, yeah, everything you say is correct, and I feel it's a hard, hard feel for me. You know, when you mm -hmm. say that, because I know how you operate, and that's how this, these are the ways you operate. Period. And I make mistakes. Know? I'm not perfect I mean, you know, by a long shot. You know, <laughs> none of us. Are none perfect, of us. Yeah, but but let me ask you something. Um, so they say that the temp dose. I don't want to cook them. They was calling them pods. And then they said, my, one of my assistants, um, um, she's over there. Um, Elizabeth, we changed the name because we couldn't stand keep calling it pods, whatever. But anyway, because um, we're going to be doing some art on the ground for, in that area. Nice. But um, so they say it's temporary, temporarily that they're going to be there. Very temporary, yeah. Yeah, so I think they, when you spend, I, politics is, is, is something else. So you, it could mean two things. It could mean people are going to live there temporarily or the or those shelters are gonna be there temporarily, you right? Know? And um, and I and um, and so I already know that two things can happen: that those those individuals who's gonna live there are temporarily, and then I and then because they only got 1.2 to do that project, um, after that money is gone, somebody's got to pay for it, for right. that, for the cost over there, right? To keep going, right? So who we gotta wrap up okay. soon too for sure. next meeting. So but. so um um. What do you do with if you have to wrap up the project? If you have a 1.2, if you you know got to pack up the, the shelters, what do you do? Well, I, I mean, I'm not the mayor, and I don't know that what the city budget is. But as a community, the community has to decide: do they want to make the investment to, if that program is successful to keep investing in that program? Yeah. And if they do, is that money going to come from cutting other programs, which may or may not be effective? So you got to look at that, and um, or taxes. and or raise revenue, and I would argue from those who can afford it. Yeah. Property taxes are not the best way to raise revenue. So sure. um, so those are the kinds of questions yeah. the city's got to yeah. grapple with. But we got to wrap. All right, right. I got to go because we got started thing late. You want to say before you go? Just thank you, and if yeah. folks have questions, they can reach out through my website, yeah. Zuckerman, F-O-R-V-T, ZuckermanForVermont.com, and uh, you know, happy to answer questions people have. Yeah. They can call the office, they can email, and we'll get back. Yes, sir. Right on. Yes, sir. Right on.